Welcome to Tattoos, Code, and Data Flows. I'm Matt Rose, Chief Architect Bionic. Thank you for listening. Really appreciate the, the time that you took out of your day to listen to the episodes. Please feel free to listen to us and all the podcasting platforms that you're familiar with. Spotify, Apple, all of the above. And also, please like and subscribe to the episodes. We're going to have a lot of great content. Enjoy. Uh, let's get ready to rumble! Walter, welcome to Tattoos, Code, and Data Flows. Very uh, happy to have you as a guest. Just for the audience, why don't you give a little background on yourself, your experience, and kind of, you know, who Walter is? Sure thing. Well, thanks a lot for having me on, Matt. Really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you and, and your audience. So as for me, I currently work as a director of product management at Privacera, which is a data access and security governance company. Before that, I worked at TTC, which is a pretty big uh, industrial automation company specifically focused on IoT security. And then before that, I spent the early part of my career in government in a variety of different capacities. I worked on Capitol Hill as a staffer. I was in the intelligence community. Uh, and then that was in, in my capacity as a Marine Corps officer where I, I, I got started out. And I uh, just want to caveat by saying uh, I'm here in my personal capacity and not, not speaking for any of those folks, but uh, looking forward to the conversation. No, oh, thank you very much. And, you know, we've kind of do a lot of the same things on LinkedIn with trying to post out informative content. And I've been uh, very impressed with a lot of the content you've been posting out there. Uh, just I think LinkedIn's a great place to learn and a great place to share information. And a lot of your posts are just, you know, kind of really hit the nail on the head. So I thought you'd be a great guest to educate the audience and, uh, you know, provide maybe a different perspective. Well, thanks a lot. I, I look forward to learning from you as well. <laughs> Excellent. So we'll move into our first section. Thinking out loud. So thinking out loud, Walter, what, you know, when you get up in the morning, what are the things that, you know, it, this could be uh, around uh, your current job, your side uh, uh, kind of activities around the LinkedIn post? What's really, you know, the thing that keeps you motivated, the thing that you're thinking about most these days? Yeah. So what I try to focus on in my professional sphere most is managing risk. So enterprises, businesses, governments, uh, you know, nonprofits, they all exist to, to do something, to make people's lives better, to deliver a product, to help somebody out with, you know, a problem that they're having. So security should be an enabler for that. And I think that security uh, conversations should start with that in mind. So security doesn't exist to serve itself in my mind. It's something that allows organizations to deliver value. And uh, that's something I try to communicate you know, in, in every aspect of, of my professional sphere. That was good. And I mean, a lot of your posts are around risk and, you know, how you digest risk. Is that, you know, are there different best practices you think around, you know, identifying and, and, and digesting and remediating risk is, you know, what, what do you think the best way to, because it's like a term people throw around like DevOps, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but risk, what does that truly mean? And people get comfortable with the term, but they don't really, you know, kind of uh, go deep on the term itself. Well, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, for me, I think you need to think about risk in absolute terms. And by absolute terms, frankly, for the most part, that means dollars. I mean, you can, you know, you can quibble over whether that's an appropriate way to uh, describe or, or value things. But, you know, cash accepted everywhere. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's a pretty, pretty commonly accepted metric for, for managing things. And one thing I, I find where people get into trouble describing risk is when they do it in qualitative or relative terms. So, you know, high, medium, low. Yeah, you know, that's useful within, uh, you know, a narrow analytical mindset or, or situation. If you're comparing two different vulnerabilities, for example, it can be useful there. But like I mentioned, the business context is really what matters. So it's very difficult to explain to a business person what a high or some medium vulnerability means. But if you talk about in, in it in dollar terms, that's something that comes across much more effectively and you're more likely to get the desired reaction. You know, if, if something is is a million dollars of risk a year versus $10,000 of risk, you know, those are two very different things. And then in terms of the qualitative terminology, different people might think that different levels of risk are, you know, could be described differently. You know, if you're if you're Amazon, your, uh, you know, $10,000 of, of annual risk is, is not a lot 
of, of risk really compared to their total revenue. But if you're a small business, $10,000 of risk over a year, I mean, that could really hurt you. So um, it's important to communicate in absolute terms about no, I agree. And I mean, I, you know, read a lot of things, read a lot of posts. And one of my favorite things, and I really like that you said risk is tied to dollars because a lot of people try and do it with fear or FUD, fear, uncertainty and doubt and say, yo, if you get hacked or if your risk is not managed, then you're going to go out of business. You're going to be on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. And I'm like, back up the truck here. Uh, major breaches, Equifax, Target, Heartland Payment Systems. I mean, there's so many that we can talk about. Last time I checked, those companies are still in business. It just cost them a lot of money to remediate what happened to them through, you know, regulations, fines, customer, you know, retention, all those type of things. So I think that putting that that financial number on risk is a much more effective because you're probably not going to go out of business. It's just going to cost you a buttload of money to recover from something uh, that potentially bad happened to you. Do you agree with that? So I would say that communicating in dollars allows you to be effective in your description of the risk. So if you look at the solar winds hack, for example, mm -hmm. you know, solar winds stock price took a major dive, you know, got cut in half. And I, I don't think it's recovered since, you know, those, uh, those revelations have come out. Uh, you know, that, that could potentially be viewed as something that's threatening the existence of the enterprise. Um, and, if, if you can communicate in those terms, and if the risk is truly that severe, then you're going to get executive attention, and they'll be able to provide you with the resources you need to address the problem. But if you're saying that every potential vulnerability, every situation is going to ruin the business or, or put you out of business, then pretty quickly, your your cries are going to fall on deaf ears, and you're just <laughs> going to get written off as, as the boy who cried wolf. So it's important to speak clearly and, and in a way that prioritizes the various different uh, threats and vulnerabilities that, that an enterprise faces. And you can do that most effectively, most effectively by speaking in terms of numbers and dollars. No, oh, a great point, great point. All right, we're gonna move into our next section. I got a lot of problems with you people. <laughs> now you're gonna hear about it. All right, so this is where you can basically get something off your chest. What What is ticking you off in the industry today? Is it a term that's misused? Is it a, a view of certain organizations or certain compliance concerns? What's What's really upsetting you in today's world of you know cybersecurity, information technology as a whole? So I try to you know keep keep my cool as much as possible. But uh, what this, that... this is this is an open forum. You can get as mad as you want here. Again, you're not representing the company. This is just right. Walter getting mad about something. So we're exactly. good. Exactly. Well, one thing that I do uh, I can get aggravated with is how security professionals will over rotate and over index on uh, what what they'll call highs and criticals. And sometimes they won't even explain what what that means. Uh, but it, you know, the way I interpret it is a scanning tool has identified a vulnerability with a CVSS score of seven or above. And you know, if you've been in the industry for any amount of time, you're going to find that uh, you're going to run into a lot of situations like that. You know, there are a lot of known vulnerabilities out there uh, that are flagged by by these tools and. Uh, you know, the, the important thing to think about is what do you do about it and what's what's the risk to the business? You know, there's a lot of research out there that shows that probably 5% or less of CVEs are exploitable in any given context. And, you know, a lot of them, uh, you know, they might have been science projects from researchers who did pretty cool stuff like conducting a side channel attack against, you know, uh, uh, the victim process from the same uh, physical compute. But, you know, from a realistic perspective, there's a very low risk that a hacker is going to exploit uh, that vulnerability. Conversely, if you look at Log4Shell, you know, that's something that required no authentication. It could be done remotely. That's an extremely high risk uh, CV uh, in terms of exploitation. So being able to differentiate between those two, uh, you know, it requires a lot of nuance that I haven't seen pervasively in the industry. So. Uh, you know, that's something that I've been working on to try to be able to communicate more effectively about the relative risk of uh, CVEs uh, that, that scanning tools find and come up with a way to more precisely differentiate them. 
Yeah, no, and I agree. And, you know, my background before I came to my current company, Bionic, was all in uh, SAS or, you know, static analysis for scanning uncompiled code. And people would always go yell at people and say, this is an issue. And they said, why? Because I said so. And I mean, you really need to be able to back that up with a little more information in terms of why I should spend my time and resources to fix this with real data. And the other thing that I think with risk scoring, too, is just focusing on the criticals and the highs, sometimes the lows are the entry point. You know, a lot of these uh, attacks are multifaceted where step one gives you additional permissions and step two gives you a little more access to a database. Step three allows you to take data out of. So it's not just about one thing working as a, as a silo. It's how everything works together in concert because that's how these things are actually really executed in a much more complex way rather than the silver bullet approach where I do A and B happens. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I think with vulnerability chaining, you can see that, as you mentioned, some of the, the lower severity in terms of CVSS uh, yep. vulnerabilities can, can be an entry point. Um, and then if you look at, for example, Heartbleed, the, the Heartbleed vulnerability initially was rated as a CVSS 5 out of 10, you know, which some organizations would just ignore that, you know, if they're just yep. looking at the CVSS score, but it led to hundreds of breaches. So, you know, I think there there are some issues with, with the CVSS uh, scoring system. I think that first, the organization that's put it together has done a good job in terms of communicating that, you know, you shouldn't use that for risk scoring. But I, I find it funny because a lot of security professionals, they'll they'll take the CVSS and then they'll ignore the guidance from the organization that created the standard and they'll use it for risk prioritization anyway, uh, which can kind of put you in a tough spot and, and actually make you overlook some of the more important threats if you're just so focused on this one aspect of a vulnerability. No, very good stuff, very good stuff. All right, now we get to be a little bit more positive with our next section. The Nirvana World section, where you could, you know, have your magic wand, create the utopian, you know, kind of world for your activities in, you know, cybersecurity and your day-to-day -day kind of responsibilities. You know, what, what would you change if you had the power uh, within the industry? I know your 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 rant session was around the rankings and, and things like that, but what would you kind of fix if you had the power? Yeah, if I had uh, if I had my way, I would just be able to point to any given vulnerability, configuration, situation, and just immediately know what the risk is in monetary terms. Because with that information, you'd be able to prioritize your the steps you're going to take so much more easily. You know, if you're buying a solution, if you're buying, you know, a SIM or, you know, EDR or what have you, you know very clearly what you're paying, you know, every month, every yep. year. Like there's, there's a price tag associated with it. But on the risk side, it's so opaque. It's so hard to understand, you know, what the value is. Um, I think there are some emerging initiatives that are, uh, you know, headed in this direction. There are obviously a lot of commercial uh, vendors out there that are that are trying to solve this problem, but also on the open source front, the exploit prediction scoring system. That's another tool from from First, that that nonprofit organization that uh, they provide a daily uh, score for every vulnerability in terms of the likelihood of exploitation. And I think that can be you can plug that into risk management formulas and come up with a much better uh, understanding of what the true risk picture is like for your enterprise. Uh, we're, we're not quite there yet where you can just push a button or snap your fingers and, and, and get a number. So that would be my, my Nirvana world. Oh, that's great. And I always like to say that, you know, looking at the, all these type of issues, no matter where they're coming from, it, it's, it's likelihood and impact are the two variables that always go away. The impact is, is atrocious, but the likelihood is very, very low. Is that something that you're going to spend the time to fix when there's probably not an opportunity for it to happen in a practical world? So it's always about playing with that impact and likelihood variable, um, which again, I think is, you know, just like the monetary value, something really hard to pin down in terms of a number. What is the impact and likelihood of, of these vulnerabilities uh, based on the information provided? Yeah, I agree that that that's a challenging part. I will say though, there's, you know, there's a fair amount of research that, you know, if you put, if you put numbers uh, on your goals, you know, you're, you're more likely to reach those goals and you're more likely to hit those goals. So I would say the same thing is true in terms of risk estimation. You're not gonna be, you're not gonna hit the target, you know, the bullseye if with every risk estimate you make, but if you have a logical system, a framework through which you can evaluate risk, 
you're going to get better over time and you're going to be much closer to ground truth than if you just kind of say, oh, you know, this is a quote critical vulnerability or a high vulnerability and we need to fix it. Well, that wraps up the Nirvana World section. So let's move on to the speed round. He's going the distance. He's going for speed. So this is just me asking you some questions and you give your opinion on, you know, kind of the statements. Some of these are a little more, I don't know, discuss controversial argumentative whatever you you know think but we'll start with do you feel the term is devops or devsecops are they the same are they different what do you use on a day-to-day -day basis or how do you differentiate between the two so i'm not a purist in terms of using those phrases in one way or another i you know i use the term devsecops because i think that specifically calling out security as part of your development and operations process is is critical but I will say that DevOps alone is complementary to security. If you are able to deploy rapidly, you know, you're going to be fixing vulnerabilities more rapidly. You're going to be ensuring that your customers have uh, better availability to your services. So I think, I think they're complementary and I don't think, uh, you know, I don't feel super strongly about one or the other. I think the, the most important thing to remember is that they're both mindsets rather than tools. So a lot mm -hmm. of vendors will try to jump on the, you know, the, the, the zeitgeist and say, oh, we're a you know, DevOps tool or DevSecOps tool. Uh, you know, they might facilitate those processes and those cultures and those methods of operation, but I think it's important to focus on the processes, the practices and, and, and the people involved in those things rather than the technologies. No, awesome stuff. Awesome stuff. So, you know, in terms of your job getting, you know, what you need to get done, is there a go-to piece of technology you use? Because, you know, people like to learn about how to work better, smarter, faster. Is there a piece of software, a, a device or something that helps you get your job done better and more effectively? I'd say that Jira is my go-to tool. It is just such a flexible platform that allows you to do so many things. And being able to track everything in a, in a ticketed way that's queryable by everybody in the organization that you can apply permissions to, you know, it's not a very exciting or, or sexy tool, but, you know, if you use it well, you can really improve productivity in your organization. Uh, you know, I consider myself a, a Jira power user and I've written some, some scripts to work with the API because, you know, I just really think that it's a great uh, piece of gear. And if you use it effectively in your organization, you can really uh, improve productivity. Awesome stuff. Uh, you know, you know, in research, who do you respect in the industry? Who do you follow, you know, listen to their podcasts? Who, you know, who do you check on a daily basis on LinkedIn? Who do you think is, is somebody that somebody should look up if they don't know about them in the industry as a whole? Yeah, I'd say one person I definitely follow pretty religiously is Rob Black. He's a, uh, he manages a virtual CISO company called Fractional CISO, and he is very, uh, very focused on the quantitative risk management side. And he also puts out a lot of videos. Some people might call them corny. I call them pretty entertaining uh, about various <laughs> security related scenarios. So uh, I would definitely recommend checking him out and, and following him. Another person that I follow pretty closely is Chris Hughes. He's at Acquia Security. He, I mean, I, I don't think I've ever seen anybody as prolific in terms of reading about developments in the industry and then communicating about him. I mean, this guy, right, I think he writes an article a day. That's what it seems like. Um, so he is very, uh, very active and he's a great person to follow because he, he drops a lot of drops a lot of knowledge into his threads and, uh, and comments and articles. Oh, very good. So another kind of theory question or a controversial topic, and this is a term I, you know, if I had hair, it would fall out every time I heard it. Is shift left still a thing? What, what the term of shift left, what's your opinion on shift left? Cause everybody likes to use it, but I think it's just really overused and misused. What's your opinion on the term? Let's shift left in terms of security. So, you know, I also don't have any hair but uh, you know, I, I I might I might cause you to to lose even more uh, because I'll say that it is a useful phrase. I, I think it is. Um, being specific about what you mean is important because if you just throw a catchphrase out there, I don't mm -hmm. think you're going to get the impact that you want. Assuming you know what impact you want. But here's here's how I think it's effective. Focusing on identifying and remediating vulnerabilities early in the development process definitely saves money. For example, 
if you do threat modeling as part of your design for a new feature, mm -hmm. you'll be able to identify potential issues ahead of time and, and mitigate them. And that's a lot cheaper than having to do a retrofit on the back end once you've gotten that code out into production. Another thing that I think is useful is getting some of the security tools to developers, getting them in their hands during the development process. For example, you know, getting a software composition analysis tool plugin for an IDE can allow uh, developers to understand, you know, what sort of dependencies they're introducing. They'll be able to, you know, I, I complained about uh, people over rotating on CVEs, but really the main way to understand if you're exposed is you, you need a developer to look at the code and understand what the interaction is. So if you do that, if you do that analysis as part of the development process, you really cut out a lot of the uh, after the fact retroactive, uh, you know, uh, firefighting that often accompanies the identification of vulnerabilities. So I do think it's useful, but it's also important to be specific in terms of what you mean and have have a set of practices that that are actually things that you can implement. With that said, you can't just ignore the rest of the development and operations lifecycle. You know, you're always going to need uh, SecOps tools. You're going to need incident response processes to deal with you know when the inevitable happens and and you have. Uh, a breach or an incident. So, you know, like all catchphrases, it's uh, well intentioned, but it requires fleshing out to be effective. Yeah, and I agree. And I mean, I think uh, the thing that drives me nuts with it is that the, the insinuation is shifting left is the only answer where I feel it should be shifting everywhere. The use cases you you gave for the left side of, you know, what an STLC used to look like uh, are very valuable, but it's like, you know, what about, you know, something that doesn't come to fruition until the code's all brought together or in runtime or anything like that. And I just want people to be aware that the left is not, you know, the end all be all. There is different aspects and it's about the use case you're looking to solve is kind of the point I like to make is let's not be just focused on the left. Let's make sure we're focused on everywhere because that's a more of a holistic approach in my opinion, but For awesome sure. stuff. Uh, you know, last question in the speed round. Um, probably do a lot of research on new companies and new technologies and the industry analysts are always throwing out new acronyms. Do you have a hot technology that you see coming out a new startup type of technology that you think is really cool that uh, you'd like to share or something you've, you've heard about and I don't know, reading an article or something like that. So I think there's been a lot of press and a lot of industry discussion about um, you know, cloud security posture management. And there are, there's a whole variety of acronyms surrounding that, <laughs> uh, you know, that tech that frankly, I'm, I've, I work in the industry and I'm a little confused sometimes, but some of it seems really interesting, you know, the ability to make configuration changes automatically based on uh, telemetry, based on identification of, of threats or vulnerabilities. Um, so it seems pretty cool, uh, but I feel like the marketing hype is almost to the point where it's deafening and and i can't even understand exactly what some of these companies do so um i i think there's potential there but needs to be fleshed out and uh if somebody could just send me like a concise one pager uh about <laughs> what all these companies do i won't name names but uh would, would love to see that because uh it's it can be a little confusing and you know people in the industry are just bombarded constantly with vendor pitches so having a really crisp pitch can be can be super helpful awesome well that's the end of the speed round thanks the great information probably the best speed round i think we've had so far your honor i move to disqualify miss Vito as an expert witness can you answer the question no it is a trick question so this is really kind of funny one of the questions i was going to ask you just stole my thunder so <laughs> i'm very upset about that so i was going to go down the path I, I i posted on linkedin you responded where i was talking about you know secure cloud and you responded what is a secure cloud and you know it's like the same thing I, I had the same impression it's like everyone talks about the secure cloud and you mentioned cspm cloud security posture management and it sounds like the hottest technology and i you know i will name names you have you know lacework and whiz and prisma cloud all these companies that are saying they can revolutionize the world and all you need is a cspm and everything is is secure you know, maybe dig in a little deeper on your, your statement of their, you know, the term secure cloud and you're not familiar with it. Cause I thought that was really interesting and, and kind of the point I was kind of make, I was trying to be a little more tongue in cheek, but you were being direct into the point, which I really appreciated. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm, I'm a pretty literal and, and blunt guy. I'll, I'll say, you know, security is never a, uh, you know, you can't 
describe security in a vacuum. Security is always relative. You know, is something as, you know, is it secure enough for its purposes? You know, I, I've used the example, like, what is your app doing? Is your app, uh, you know, is it storing pictures of cute kittens? Okay, I mean, like you have some needs there. Probably <laughs> the biggest need there is like availability so your users can download the the cat pictures. Uh, but, you know, if, if the, all the cat pictures get leaked on the internet, like it's not really going to be that big a deal. Uh, on a similar note, you know, there are a lot of people, I used to be in government, uh, a lot of people get very um, kind of fired up about, um, you know, security vulnerabilities in, in especially in military uh, systems, you know, I'll, but I'll ask, like, is it a, uh, you know, a dining hall menu tracking system that has a security <laughs> vulnerability? Like, yeah. okay, I get it. It's in a Department of Defense system. That's that's bad, all things being equal. But like, it's not that big a deal compared to, you know, the F-35, which is a huge weapons project that's consumed you know, potentially a trillion dollars. You know, that has security vulnerabilities in its onboard systems. That's probably a bigger deal than than the previous two um, instances that, that I've described. Um, so really what I'm talking about is that you can't describe any given item as secure or insecure. They're, they're going to just be uh, gradations and, and different levels of security. So, you know, if you tell me that it's a secure cloud, I'll say, well, okay, you know, what, what's it protecting? What, what type of information is it holding? What are the threats? What are the vulnerabilities? You'll, you'll need a much more nuanced and detailed picture to, to understand its level of security. No, the analogy you gave makes me laugh because I use almost the same analogy all the time when we're talking about, you know, uh, an application portfolio risk kind of lens. Okay, what are my top tier, middle tier, bottom tier? And I said, is this my, uh, you know, mission critical revenue generating e-commerce app or is this the app I used to order lunch in the office? Right. And I think it's really funny that you had the same kind of approach. It's like not all apps are create the same. So not all risk within those uh, apps or, or software for that matter are really the same. So. Great stuff. Now he's getting a tattoo, yeah, he's getting ink done. He asked for a 13, but they drew a 31. So this is more of the uh, the social aspect of the podcast. You know, a lot of people uh, in technology, in security, it's more of an alternative type of look type of thing. Uh, one of the things, you know, as you hire people or know people around you, is there kind of something that would remove somebody from the equation. Uh, There's a lot of press around women with tattoos and professional and, you know, being loud and proud with kind of how they look and who they are. What's your opinion on kind of the diverse kind of, I don't know, what's the best word I'm thinking here? Personal expression of themselves. I'll say in the security world, I haven't seen any research indicating that there's any correlation between your physical appearance and your ability to uh, defend data against attackers. So. You know, I'll kind of just just leave it there. You know, as as someone I, I mentioned, I was in the Marine Corps. I probably know more about tattoos than anyone in the world who who doesn't have a <laughs> tattoo, because the Marine Corps just has like excruciating levels of detail in terms of uh, regulations on what type of tattoos you can have and what you can, and they actually just cha they change back and forth. Um, you know. When I was uh, when I was in the military, it was just like a huge headache. I'm like, come on, guys! Like, I I, I don't really want to track like the number and size and location of uh, of all my Marines <laughs> tattoos. So like, let's just uh, let's just get with it. I think the the only potential caveat I'd have there. I mean, this this doesn't relate to security, but you know, in some in some places, uh, you know, tattoos can have a certain connotation. So I think the Marine Corps is like pretty focused on the Marine Corps security guards and things like that having uh, having tattoos because they don't want to miscommunicate to uh, you know to certain uh, certain different cultures. But I think overall, uh, where we are in 2022, you know, uh, let, let's just let's just forget about it and, and uh, focus on competence and uh, an ability to do the job. Oh, very well said. So I have a question. You said the Marines change the standard. What happens yeah. if you already have a tattoo that then doesn't fit the standard? I yeah. just I'm curious about what happens there. Yeah. Well, I, I mentioned the documenting part. So the standard got stricter right right as, as I was joining the Marine Corps. So there are all these Marines who had tattoos under the old policy, mainly sleeves. So I, you had to document all these grandfathered in tattoos. And that, that that's what was taken up uh, so much time. And then just recently, I think, uh, you know, within a couple of months, you know, I've been out for a while, but within a couple of months, it just flipped back. So 
all the experience, <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of open season again on, on getting sleeve tattoos uh, with some of those caveats that I mentioned. So, you know, it, it kind of, it, it, it flips back and forth and uh, it's, it's hard to keep track. And, you know, at a certain point I was like, come on guys, let's, we, we got more important things to focus on. Yeah, I, I yeah, I know nothing about the sleeve type stuff, yeah. but uh, I, I, you know, I probably everyone when they change that standard, probably everybody ran because it's like the drinking age drops and everyone yep. goes out, and then oh, yeah. like we got to do this now because it could oh, change yeah. back. Oh yeah, get grandfathered in for the next time, right? Exactly. Well, awesome. Well, now we're going to move into the the closing time. Closing time. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay. Well, I just want to thank you for being on. This is your opportunity to plug something that you're passionate about. It doesn't have to be something associated with technology. It could be, you know, a, a charity or something you're very passionate about. So, you know, the, the, the soapbox is yours, if you will. Great. Well, you know, thanks a lot for having me on. I, I'd love to plug a charity that I work for called Service to School. It's an organization that mentors veterans who are trying to move into uh, from the military into higher education. Um, so, you know, I, I mentor a, a veteran here and there. I also do informal mentoring. So, you know, any veteran who um, is interested in moving into the technology world, into the cybersecurity world, I've got a, a kind of open invitation. I do have some, some conditions, some, some pre-work you need to do before, uh, <laughs> before I talk to you, but uh, maybe I can send you some show notes with, uh, with, with more information on that. Happy to mentor, uh, you know, anyone leaving the military who, who's trying to, break into the technology world. No, that's awesome. And just uh, total transparency, my brother was, uh, you know, in the Army. He was an Apache pilot and did two tours. So appreciate your your service because I know near and dear, I love my brother to death. So I think it's it's great that you're you're supporting uh, veterans moving into more of the uh, the the private sector after their, their tours are over. I want to thank Walter for joining us on Tattoos, Code, and Data Flow today. It was a great discussion, a lot of technical details, which I found very interesting. It was just a great episode. Please like, subscribe, follow, listen to the podcast on your favorite podcast platform. 